Well, hello, hello, and welcome to another Obstruction to Justice broadcast where we talk about current issues, we have answers, provide business information. I'm Ann Moles. Thanks for stopping by. Today, we're going to talk with author, historian, Larry Lester. Larry how is it going? Well, thank you, Sister Moles. Uh, pleasure to be on Obstruction to Justice. Oh, I'm so glad that you made it. Now, here, I need to take it a little bit farther because <laughs> not only are you a historian and author, but you're president of the Greater Kansas City Black History Study Group. Yes. and chairman of the Society for the American Baseball Negro League Research Committee. You got yes. a lot going on, my brother. <laughs> Very proud of you. <laughs> uh, thank you. I'm juggling a lot of balls. That is a good, you, and no pun intended, because <laughs> you are, you're the guy when it comes to the Negro League baseball. You are the premier historian, the uh, elite historian when it comes to the history of our uh, great heritage of the Negro League Baseball. And I just was very, very pleased to see that you are still very active in what yes. you do with uh, the, the baseball museum and not so much the museum anymore. We may get into that a little bit, but you have evolved. It's like there's always a starting point, but you have evolved into continue on telling the great story of the history of the athletes of, of old and which opens doors uh, for the athletes today. Uh, we really, there's so much to cover today, and I just am excited about it. But let's go out. I want to go out to your website. Okay. <laughs> and we're going to go out here and take a look at the website that you have because it's very interesting. Very interesting. Now, for all of you all who are interested in baseball, interested in African American history, uh, you definitely need to go out to LarryLester42.com. That's L A R R Y L E S T E R 42. That's the number 42.com. And check it out. It is very, very timely when it comes to uh, providing. Uh, an overview of, of great historical research, pictures, images of baseball, the baseball years gone by. Mm -hmm. And of course, it just sets it up for more time in sports. And we get excited about our current, current uh, people that are still in sports. Now, I don't know too many people who are currently uh uh, doing the the sports thing, I'm not I'm big on sports, but how about those Chiefs? <laughs> <laughs> they're doing all right. They are doing all right, aren't they? Now they're playing. They play uh, football. You're into baseball, but to me, it's all good. It's like all good. It just makes me stand up and cheer. I tell you, it it's does all about that. that competitive spirit. A competitive spirit and. Not only that competitive spirit, but the perseverance mm -hmm. of the spirit. Now, when it comes to history, we know our African-American roots uh, of history, historical accounts of what people of the past have had to go through. And really, it's, it's now, even though it, historically... African American Black history, we still perseverance is kind of part of it, isn't it? 
Yes, perseverance, resilience, uh, mm -hmm. looking for a little redemption, some respect, mm -hmm. you know, all, mm -hmm. all the R's, recognition, just, it all, it all comes together in trying to respect the history and the road that they paved for us, the younger generation of African Americans to prosper. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's been a good journey. Uh, I've learned so much from these men and what they went through and it, it helped shape my life uh, to, to become a better, better father, husband, uh, brother and friend. So that is cool. Yes. Now 42, 42. <laughs> now that, that number sticks out. It sticks out. Uh, what is it about the number 42? Now I notice here out on the website, you have, it, it looks good and that it gives us, uh, it's very straightforward where you can go out and you have different tabs that jump out and, and uh, highlight the areas of what it is that you uh, would explain under that tab. So number mm -hmm. 42, we have 42 tribute. Oh, I think I'm getting close here. What that <laughs> number 42 is. Right. Mm -hmm. Is it about uh, Brother Jackie Robinson? Yes, it is. Okay. <laughs> oh, what a neat, what a neat page here. Now, why, why the number 42? Tell us about how you got, <clears throat> got into that. Why is that an important number for you? Well, in 1960, I was around 10 years old and I lived in the American League City. And so I never saw any National League teams. So I did, I did not get to see Jackie Robinson, Willie Mays, Hank Aaron and Roberto Clemente play in Kansas City. Unless the Kansas City Athletics went to the World Series, which they never did, of course. OK, so now, two mm -hmm. seconds, Kansas City Athletics. Oh, all right. That right now it's the Kansas City Royals. That's correct. So what, 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 why was it the Kansas City Athletics back then, and and who were they? Why, what's that team all about? Well, the Kansas City Athletics were the first uh, major league team to come to Kansas City. Okay. And so, uh, I lived next to the ballpark. I went to a lot of ball games. Only cost a dollar and fifty cents to get in, and kept score. Scorecard cost 15 cents. Get a little pencil and I'd keep score. I learned now, math. The ballpark, the mm -hmm. ballpark here, was this ballpark you were mentioning here in Kansas City? Yes, on 22nd in Brooklyn. 20, okay, that's right around the corner from Lincoln, isn't it? Exactly. Well, oh, yes, I remember that ballpark. Right. Actually, I remember that ballpark. I was actually going to the junior high school there the last year, the season before they opened up the major, the, the stadium out here uh, off of I-70. Mm -hmm. they, they actually played there. So you got a chance to go into that ballpark and enjoy it. So they yeah. gave you gave you a little, you were... Oh, tallying yeah. up some scores there. Yeah, I love math and I can keep the scores. I learned the nuances of the game and strategy. And uh, <clears throat> but I was a little bit uh, moved by seeing so many white fans in the stands when the neighborhood was 100 percent black. Hmm. I, I mm -hmm. couldn't figure out where all these white folks came from. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I became curious and asked people. In my neighborhood, fathers, grandfathers, the elders, and they would tell me about the Negro League players. And that's how I became interested in the Negro Leagues. And cool. so when Jackie Robinson came to town, I read about him in the paper. I asked my father to take me to hear him speak on behalf of presidential candidate uh, uh, Richard Nixon. And he did. Uh, it was pretty boring for a 10 year old, but. Uh, Jackie Robinson came to the stage in a high pitched voice, and I've been a fan ever since. I don't, now, I don't remember Jackie, what he said, but <laughs> I, now I, Jackie I like Robinson that. had a high pitched voice. Yes. Oh, okay. I didn't <laughs> know that. I didn't know that. To look at him, you think he would be a baritone, but he was more like an alto. <laughs> okay, cool, cool. So you got a chance to see Jackie Robinson 
for the first time. There were some questions going on and, and, you know, all of the European Americans that were hanging out at the baseball field, <laughs> even though it was a predominantly African American uh, community, yes. you know, there would be some, some questions going off there, but you got, and then Richard Nixon. So you got a chance to see Rick, Richard Nixon too, huh? Yeah, well, <laughs> I wasn't there for Nixon. I wasn't there for Nixon, but you were there for 42. Yeah, Jackie it was, uh, it was yeah. an interesting time, man, you know, in my development as a youth. Uh, you know, my school was black. My church was black. Mm -hmm. My neighborhood was black. and So, you know, for a moment there, I thought we were the majorities. <laughs> well, you know, that right there is something to say because... Uh, integration, even though it, it's uh, a good thing to bring the gel of all of the different mm -hmm. cultures and communities together in America, because that's one thing that makes America is that we are a melting pot of many mm -hmm. different cultures, uh, races. Uh, but uh, with the, the integration, I think that that was something that it, we didn't know that we were so segregated and it was all <laughs> right did. because we still had everything in our communities. We had a uh, Drucker's grocery store right next yes. door mm -hmm. uh, where we could pick up our fresh fruits and vegetables. We had Lou's Cafe there on Vine Street. There you go. We had Junk Shop Willie's <laughs> down there. We had the Palace Cab. So <laughs> I forgot about them. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and we had the A&P, which was a little ways away, yeah. but it was the A&P, even though it wasn't an African-American store. We, we we went to, you know, Drucker's grocery store where right. we wanted to, to hang out with. And, you know, he still had the candy. He had everything, everything a kid would need. So, yes, uh, that that was a very interesting time for for us and me growing up, I got the tail end of that. Uh -huh. So uh, we, my my family had the soul food restaurant down there on Vine Street, Lou's Cafe. I've been and, there. <laughs> oh, really? I did not know that. And uh, Aunt Lou, I, I uh, learned how to cook by calling her on the phone and asking her, what do I do? And she definitely gave me those recipes. So it sounded like you got into baseball by going to the games where the baseball field, the baseball diamond, so were in, it was in your neighborhood and you could get there. Now, that's yeah. something to say. That's something yeah. to say. I could walk to the ballpark and we didn't have crime like we have today. And I could walk home at 11 o'clock at night unimpeded uh, without any escort. Uh, we didn't even lock the front door. I mean, it's mm -hmm. just, it's just a different time period. It was a different time. It was a different time. So number 42, you got to meet him for the first time. He, uh, you were excited about him and, you know, that was, that's something about, we think of they, people, sports people as heroes in a sense that they were doing something that we probably aspired to do. They were, uh, doing things that uh, allow for them to exert themselves and and they were educated or whatever, just people, African-Americans doing great things. Exactly. Uh, well, as you know, Jackie Robinson was an activist, uh, a political activist, and uh, he spoke out. He had some columns in some New York newspapers. He did an editorial uh, every week. So, uh he helped shape my voice, for a better word. He mm -hmm. helped helped shape me to be someone who is outspoken. And when I see something, I say something if I think it's wrong. So that's why Jackie Robinson is my hero. All right. Number 42. Number 42. <laughs> and, you know, if, if anyone that if you want to, guys, come out here to the website and click on uh, the number 42, and it does have an overview of what the explanation of uh, that was given by our brother Larry Lester, how he got started there. It talks a little bit about that, and it's got a cool picture of him. 
Uh, <laughs> he's got a cool picture out there and you'll get a chance to check that out too. Now you are also an author, mm -hmm. brother Lester, an author. And when I hover over the books tab, I see, oh my goodness, uh, black baseball's national showcase mm -hmm. and updated. I see Negro Leagues Book Volume 1, Negro Leagues Book Volume 2, uh, Black Baseball National Showcase, uh, Black uh, Baseball's First Colored World Series. Right. Oh, that looks interesting. I'm going to click on that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Oh, look at this picture. Now, see, that's something and you have a background. I'm going to I'm trying to wait for that to save that till the end. Okay. Uh, and I want to talk about the, the pictures that are in your background here uh, with your with your uh, your background. But here, here we go. Now, that was that is the Kansas City. That's Kansas City right there. Are you serious? Before they put the second level on. That was Municipal Stadium in 1924. Oh, my goodness. And they hosted the Colored World Series. That's what it was called back then. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Kansas and that's City not, Monarchs. Kansas City Monarchs. Okay. Versus the Hilldale Club out of Darby, Pennsylvania. Oh, my goodness. And Guys, you see them lined up. They're lined up. Go out here and look at this. It, it's got a little carousel and it will uh, take you. You can actually see the, the players lined up. And this is history. I I was I saw I didn't get a chance to, to hang out at the municipal stadium, <laughs> but I was there. I was in, in the neighborhood around there. But here, this is a black and white photo mm -hmm. of the Kansas City Monarchs. And um, this is something that you could definitely enjoy here. Just a picture here on the website now. And below is the ball signed by the 1924 team. Oh, my goodness. Now, this ball here, do we know where it is? <laughs> no, we don't. Okay. All right. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I got you. I got you. Okay. <laughs> Cool. See now, this is uh, this is the book. So yes. now this is the book. Now here, it's super reasonable. I'm gonna say this. Where is? I'm gonna share. Now this book, the book that that you're that you're seeing here on the website, a review of baseball's first colored World Series. I think that would be a wonderful gift i would give this book to any any uh young person that knows how to read that can appreciate the book that enjoys african-american history and i tell you it's a good looking book well, thank uh, you. i would definitely uh definitely purchase this book and we can go out there now it looks like from here you can purchase the book from the website right here and um Assigned cover copies are available. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's something where the author can sign it. And that's part of history. Now, I'm going to tell you, this brother has gone out. I'm going to stand on my little soapbox a little bit. <laughs> brother Larry Lester has gone out and he has studied this. This is a gift that was given to him, the desire to want to know about the heritage and the legacy of African-American people. And we as African-American people, I, I know that there are many cultures that get to enjoy their culture. You have the Jewish culture and they have different ceremonies and the cultures of what they do, how they celebrate their religion. You have a uh, Spanish cultures, Mexican cultures, all different types of cultures, Asian, Chinese uh, cultures. And the first thing someone wants to say is that black people don't have a culture. Well, shame on them because we certainly, most certainly do. Yes. And this is why historians are so, so, so very important. So very important. Yeah. Now, black baseball does matter. It, <laughs> <laughs> you better believe it. Because with that, 
there's so many stories about the Negro League, black baseball, the perseverance. 1924 was not a pretty time for us, no. for African Americans, it, when it comes to the inter, in, in trying to get along and, and just be, just be right uh we were we were uh, persecuted in so many different ways lynching was still super uh big it was big going on during that time but yet and there's jim crow south the jim yes. crow segregation that these black men had to get through and press through and still hold their dignity to know that hey they were super gifted super talented mm -hmm. huh had it definitely going on so this was this is part of our culture uh now we do more than sports but there <laughs> yes, <we do. laughs> there is a character there isn't there a character development when it comes to uh number one they had to go through so much it being 1924 but well yes we had mm -hmm. prohibition and, you know, the Jim Crow laws. Mm -hmm. And of course, it, we still have some re resistance today. I call it the black tax, where we're criminalized, marginalized, and sometimes chastised for just walking down the street. Yes. Yeah. So these men, they played the black tax up front, and we're still paying that tax today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, but th this was an interesting uh, journey. Uh, I flew to Philadelphia, took the trolley car to Darby, Pennsylvania, and interviewed the residents who were still around, alive, old enough to remember the uh, 24 World Series and got some great interviews. Oh, my goodness. So that was one of my first books. But uh, I would yeah, definitely I'm lucky. purchase this. I would definitely purchase this for any young person and uh, make sure they keep it in their collection. If you're going to get them a video game. And how much do those video games cost nowadays? <laughs> huh? you, you can certainly pass along some heritage. A lot uh, of change. <laughs> heritage for uh, retail $39. I'm going to say it. I think that's that's great. Now, we got we talked about that book that that's but there's other book options to, you know, definitely um, that you can check out. Now, let's look at. Malloy, the Malloy Conference. Okay. Mm. Yeah, the Malloy Conference looks very interesting to me because what I, in this, I it looks interesting because I, I've talked with you about it, but you have testimonials and then there are different places that you've been. Tell us about what the Malloy Conference is all about. Well, the Malloy Conference is an academic conference where professors historians and authors can come and give a presentation on a specific topic regarding black baseball history. Uh, many of these topics are not the norm. And so the, it, this gives these people an opportunity to talk about something that's not in the mainstream. Uh, we, the conference lasts uh, Friday and Saturday. We have an awards banquet on Saturday night. Uh, we go to the ball game on Friday night. We also have a players panel, uh, usually on Saturday afternoon, where you'll see, like in this case, the Satchel Page family came in and did a presentation. Uh, we might have four or five ball players do a panel, and uh, we have we have a great time. We really do. Uh, we raise monies uh, to have four. $1,000 scholarships to a high school senior on a national oh. level and two $500 library grants on a national level. It's not local. Okay. And so anybody in the world can apply for these scholarships. It's on the national scholarship website and we get hundreds of essays about a, a specific topic, topic that we send out. And we have judges uh, who who, who go through the process of reading every essay and say, this is our four winners this year, Larry, and send them a check for a thousand dollars, non-restrictive. Okay. 
that's just non-restrictive, so they don't have to use it, say, for a particular thing, but uh, they uh, is it, it they don't have to use it for a particular thing. So they it's a thousand dollar scholarship that that will just to help them along. Is that right? It? Most scholarships are earmarked for books only or mm -hmm. tuition only. Well, sometimes you need a little extra cash to that's it get there. Help them along, sure. Uh, I definitely I agree with that, and that's that's super. Now it looks like the last conference here was held in Kent Kansas City was in 2016. So uh, yes, uh, we had a great turnout. One of our biggest conferences ever. Oh man, people came from everywhere. We have people come from Canada, South America to the conference. Cool. Uh, it's a it's a full blown conference. Former, oh, oh well. Anyway, some of the some of the children, uh, daughters and sons of Negro League players show up, mm -hmm. and we honor them. And and we give out awards like uh, the MVP award, which stands for the most valuable partner, uh, the person that raised the most money. They get a MVP award. Uh, in the honor of former commissioner Faye Vinson. Uh, Faye Vinson autographs a book for them called The Last Commissioner. Mm -hmm. And I give that uh, that that award along with the book to the newest recipient. And we've done 15 of those. Cool. And we give other awards for the best book of the year and uh, best presentation, et cetera, et cetera. So mm -hmm. it's all about giving back. I have no paid staff. Uh, everybody's a volunteer, including myself. So all the money coming in goes back out to benefit an organization or an individual. Mm -hmm. Now, I have a quick question. Malloy Conference. How did you all come up with that name, Malloy? Oh, one of my mentors was a fellow by the name of Jerry Malloy, uh, an incredible, gracious, giving person. He was always willing to share research. Uh, he died suddenly at a very young age, and uh, my committee, we thought it would be appropriate to name the conference uh, the Jerry Malloy Negro League Conference instead of just the Negro League Conference. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we advertise it as the biggest, baddest, and best baseball conference in America. <laughs> Sounds like it is to me. Uh, in a, it, these are volunteer efforts. And, you know, I'm a firm believer in when you're going to be a volunteer and you have uh, an organization that helps others, I believe the success comes when others participate in donating and volunteering too, right? Definitely. So, you know, you, you don't just hoard things and hoard your time, hoard your finances, but you share in it. So you share in it. You guys are volunteers for, sounds like you're a volunteer for all of what you're doing here. So all of the donations that come in goes out to the cause that it's called for, that's going to help young people. And so I would like to definitely participate <laughs> okay. yeah, and volunteer and give what I can too. And then that makes it bigger. It's, it's a, it's a world of giving so that not only are, are the ones that are giving, giving, but I get to give and it's a big snowball of giving, right? Yes, it is. And we welcome all donations in any amount. We'll be in Birmingham in 2021. Birmingham, okay. Alabama. We were scheduled in 2020, but you know what happened there. Oh my goodness! Yes, Every whole country locked down. But uh, we got a, an awesome lineup uh, in Birmingham, where Willie May started his professional career in 1948, and uh, we will probably tour Rickwood Field, the oldest ballpark in America. It's over 100 years old. Where, where Willie Mays played, and several other Negro League leaguers uh, also performed. Cool. Now it's it's cool that you guys named this conference after it. I don't. I didn't recognize the name. Just a great guy, huh? Yeah, he's not a household guy. name. Uh, he stayed undercover most of the time. But mm -hmm. uh, anybody who ever wanted to share research, he was more than willing to help. Super. Uh, great mentor to me and others. Mm -hmm. 
super. Now, I, I, I heard about some of the donations. Uh, once the donations come in at, through the Malloy Conference, mm -hmm. I understand that it goes out for the scholarships that are given to, uh, to students, library grants. Uh-huh. Now, how does that work? You know, I, you know, I hear about the library grants. You hear like the Gates Foundation, they give away uh, computers and all that to uh, certain libraries or libraries. So is that, well, what do you guys donate? What do you do for the libraries? Well, Sister Ann, we, we see a void in many libraries in that they don't have any <clears throat> books about black baseball. Yeah, that's something to think of. Sure. Yeah. yeah. So if, if your library wins the grant, then we give you $500 to buy books about black baseball, about Negro League baseball to fill your library. So some of these young kids can come in there and learn more about black baseball. There's a lot of children's books on the Negro Leagues, but mm -hmm. they're not in some libraries. Okay. Okay. And that, yes, that's definitely important. So let's say, for instance, you know, the library would be able to uh, get uh, the wonderful book about the first colored World Series. Exactly. Right? Mm -hmm. So they could uh, afford to have that in the library where students can or and people can check it out and enjoy it and then turn it in. Oh, that makes sense. OK. Sure. Yeah. No excuses. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> for sure. You know, now the uh, another thing, what other um, what other things does the Malloy Conference support? Uh, well, we also have a grade marker project. Oh, OK. OK. Uh, uh, years ago, uh, Dr. Jeremy Kroc approached me about putting headstones on unmarked graves of Negro League players. Mm -hmm. uh, the challenge there is we have to get permission from the family, mm -hmm. uh, which we've been able to do. Uh, some of the ball ballplayers uh, died in poverty uh, because they didn't have a way, a means of making a living after they quit playing ball. Mm -hmm. For example, wow. Coop Bell was a security guard at the city hall in St. Louis. Uh, but he, because he's famous, it was easy to raise money for him. But some of these ball players are unknown, unrecognized, and unappreciated. So we identified probably 50 unmarked graves. And in the past 12 years, we have been able to purchase headstones for about 38 or 39 of them. Wow. Uh, we do about three every year. We're scheduled to do three more in 2021. Uh, we just raise money. Uh, it costs between $750 to $1,200 for a nice headstone. And as you can see from my website, they are custom made uh, for that ball player. Mm -hmm. Some of them have been without a headstone for 50 or 60 years. Oh my goodness! You see, saw White there. He was he was without a headstone in 1955. This man is in the National Baseball Hall of Fame, but he didn't have a headstone. Oh my goodness! And as you can see, the city just comes out and just when marching bands and politicians show up and give speeches like they know who he was, <laughs> it's all good. Mm, 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 mm. And you can see there, he put out the first first definitive history about black baseball. My goodness. In 1910, I believe, 1907. 1907. Mm -hmm. That's what it says here. So it, he, he was long overdue for an honor. And we, we travel from different cities to cities to uh, dedicate a marker. You know, we may be in Wichita, Kansas, then St. Louis, then Topeka, and then Chicago. We did 17 headstones at a Bear Oak Cemetery in Chicago one year. That's mm -hmm. where Emmett Till is buried. Emmett Till is buried there too. Mm -hmm. Now, for those who don't remember who Emmett Till was, he was the teenager that was uh, visiting his family in the southern town in the south and was uh, murdered for allegedly whistling at uh, a white American woman. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and he was murdered. And his mother, just so that 
the world would know and not try to sweep things under the rug and hide and cover things like so many of the crime had been done during that time. Uh, she brought the body home to Chicago and yes. put the body on display where everyone could see what happened to her son and that uh, horrific act of murder because of whatever lie. You know, we, we don't know the, the true history or story about it, but, you know, sometimes we, you know, we had heard that it was a lie, wasn't true anyway, but the fact that a child was murdered, right. nothing. For the yeah. hate because of the color of his skin. Now, sad, sad. Very, sad, very sad. And so many, and, and here's the thing I, I don't think, I think life is a, it's a journey. It's a journey and mm -hmm. it has this ebb and flows. Hmm. So with that, uh, you'll, you'll have like this great, great uh, ball player who, was a historian in his own right. He wrote a book mm -hmm. <laughs> about, about baseball here. So he himself found himself in a bad way, even though, you know, he had done great things. And then your organization remembers that the, the uh, plight of those that have passed on and weren't given the opportunity to be properly marked you know, as far as their grave. So I think that is just a very honorable thing to do. And this is a, you're, you're a black organization. I will say that because you are mm -hmm. headed by uh, an African-American man, which is yourself. You are African-American. So, you know, headed by a great African-American organization that is seeing about the history of African Americans. Now, this is way before February. It's not February Black History Month. <laughs> I'm black. It's 12 months out of the year, y'all. <laughs> My color doesn't change. I'm not vanilla or half and half. I'm not Neapolitan. <laughs> you know, yeah, I'm we black. celebrate Black History every day. Every day. Every day. <laughs> and I'm hoping that some young person would definitely get hold to this broadcast and be encouraged to know that it is it is beautiful to be black and it's a proud thing to be black african american every day and that black people do see about each other yes Amen. we do <laughs> so in spite of what the media tells you uh we do see about each other and that's the point that is the point and you can definitely see this great the grave markers here he does mm -hmm. have a uh, tribute to the soul uh soul white saul white king solomon white huh? now click on name? the grave marker header okay let's see at the here. top just click on the header hmm. grave markers okay yeah yes you click right there mm -hmm. no, no not there up above oh, just here okay uh -huh. okay and you can see some of the headstones that we have put on. Okay. We have developed. Okay. We have a great designer. They are nice. Mm hmm They are nice. And he updates the Wikipedia. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I try. <laughs> yeah. So that's super. You know, everything you get out there on Wikipedia isn't always correct, guys. I just want no, you to know not. that. But it looks like uh, we try, brother Larry Lester is definitely on it to keep going. There's some some video out here too, where you can uh, enjoy that and get some information about that. So yeah, I am just super impressed and very proud to to hear and to know that you guys definitely see about the people who've done great things. But you know fell on hard times or the time it just was the time so they passed and we remember them we remember them and honor them your organization we, we, we have that. received uh some great recognition uh it was on the front page of the new york times hmm. uh brian williams on nbc nightly news did a feature on this segment about okay. our great marker project and it was featured in sports illustrated so uh, we don't work in a vacuum, uh, mm -hmm. but we've gotten some recognition for our work. We're very appreciative of it. 
Good, good. It's good to hear. Um, and of course, donations, you know, you guys are having another conference coming up here in Birmingham. Yeah. So again, this is another opportunity to participate and get the word out so that, okay, yes. Brian, Brian Williams, he did a great job. The New York Times did a great job, but we're going to still uh, ring that bell for Oh, the thank you. Negro League, the Negro League uh, histo history mm -hmm. that you uh, provide there for us. Okay, so we've talked about the Malloy Conference and the books. The books, are, I, you guys, look, I'm going to go out here and we're going to take a look at there's uh, books out here that this brother has put together and has some interesting, interesting photographs too. So let me go ahead and share this screen with that. Give me a minute and we'll go out here and share this. They're out on Amazon. Okay. So did we get it up? All yes. right. I see. They are out here on Amazon and they're available in Kindle editions or mm -hmm. paperback. Now I definitely would want to get some of the more colorful books, I would want to get them in the paperback or get them in the book form. I, I get the Kindle. Kindle is kind of for, you know, reading and, and everything reference, right. but I, I want to see the pictures that, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do that, too. that is what is super exciting to see these older pictures, these pictures out here. Now, Ruby Foster in his time, is can you share a little bit about who Ruby Foster was? Well, he's considered the godfather of black baseball. Oh my goodness. Yeah, Rube Foster, Andrew Rube Foster came to Kansas City in mm -hmm. 1920 and organized the Negro National League, the first league, first black league to survive a full season. He had owners from seven other uh black teams to form the Negro National League in 1920, and that's why Major League Baseball uh, looks at 1920 through 1948 as Major League uh, teams. So okay. he he's the man who had the vision. Uh, he was, had a robust character, a Rolodex memory. Uh, always smoked a pipe and big man, you know, about 260 pounds, and he. He, he moved his weight around in more ways than one. And I had to write a book about the man who really started this, this history and, and made it a permanent structure. Before, before 1920, there were a lot of independent black teams, but they were without structure and no league and no contracts and what have you. But Rube Foster made it all happen. So I talk about his time growing up in, in Texas, coming to Chicago, and how he was a dominant pitcher in the 19 teens, teens and 1920s. Mm -hmm. uh, so I had to write a book about the mastermind. The beginning, huh? Yeah. Yes. Okay, super. Well, it's out here, guys. It looks like there's a Kindle edition. Mm -hmm. and you grab that history out. They're very reasonably priced, I will say. And definitely, uh, you know, what, what I glean, too, from history books and the stories of those that have uh, come before us and have accomplished, persevered to accomplish the God-given, I just believe it's God-given uh, tasks and things to do. What I enjoy gleaning from them are, are the stories uh, of perseverance and uh, to overcome in spite of the odds. It's the most miraculous and it is a miracle i believe mm -hmm. many miracles that have been when you want to see a miracle in in life look at the lives of human beings that were uh, persecuted and uh, just destroyed or you know even to the point of wanting to to kill us off kill people off to you know to torment them and and yet uh, Maya Angelou and Still I Rise. Oh, yeah. Oh, 
<laughs> oh my goodness, you know, and still I rise. That's the miracle. That's what I'm yes. trying to say, guys. You know, you you think that miracles are eerie and you know misty and foggy and woo -woo -woo. no, the miracle is really life, the life's journey and overcoming. And I'm sure that Rube Foster uh, sharing that um, information would definitely give you some inspiration to go on, especially in these challenging times. Now I see yeah. the Negro leagues book, the Negro leagues book. So what would we see in that particular book? Uh, that's a generic name. And there you will see a register of about 6,000 ball players who played like baseball, the years that they played, the teams that they played for. There's a section on all the colleges that they attended. You can find out another section on uh, what uniform number they wore. A lot of people ask me, wouldn't I want to get a uniform of Rue Foster. What, what uniform number did he wear? Well, it's right there in the book. You, you'll find all the awards that these Negro League players have won. Uh, I have a section in there that shows you all the all-star games that they played in. Uh, I go all the way back to 1862. That's the first black baseball game I could find uh, right before the Civil War. Okay. I, I can document that black folks were playing baseball before the Civil War and oh. not, as some people believe, it started with Jackie Robinson in 1947. Okay. That that's all. That's funny. I, I'm sorry. I mean, I have to laugh. Yeah. I mean, yes, go ahead. So you, you, you see all these uh, different tables and charts is mostly in an encyclopedia, uh, all the awards named after Negro league players. Uh, there's also a cemetery section where you can find uh, where your favorite ball player is buried. Uh, what I do every Memorial Day, I go around to all the family plots and I put flowers on everybody's grave. And then I come home and we go to Memorial Day picnic. But in the morning, that's what I do. And so I had to do that last section, my cemetery section to show where all the great ball players are buried. Uh, so it's about 550 pages. Wow. Uh, That's a is, nice reference book. Yeah. It, it, I had two publishers who wanted to put a $95 price tag on it. And I said, no, that's, uh, no, we want to make it affordable. We don't want people to frame the book. We want people to read it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and again, it's so reasonably priced that if you have a young person, I don't care what sport they're in. OK, I don't care if they're football players, uh, what sport they're in. This is a, it's so reasonably priced that where you can actually get your young person uh, the Rube Foster book for mm -hmm. inspiration. And then this other stat books, I mean, just just so that they can have it as reference and be able just to kind of thumb through and the awards. W if we don't see the accomplishments uh then we we don't really appreciate who we are. And I say as African-Americans, um, we need to appreciate who we are. I work with young people every day and I work with all kinds of young people, uh, multicultures of young people mm -hmm. every day. And that's one of the most exciting things about my uh, what I do is that I can choose to do that well. With that, if a young person is going to crack open a book, which we do encourage, I want to encourage mm -hmm. all young people, come on, let's read. Older people don't want to read, but it's more than just the TV. It's more than just the video. Let's read. Let's open our eyes and ingest uh, so that we can understand, hey, these are awards that were named after famous black people or people exactly. who, were, who were doing things. Then, so we have a great rich history, even mm -hmm. during a time of adversity in our lives. Well, I can, I can share with you one of the most popular chapters in this book is the one I did on women in baseball. Okay. Uh, there I were five you. black women who played in the Negro Leagues. Really? Uh, had several 
female owners of Negro League teams. One of them is Effa Manley. She's the only woman in the National Baseball Hall of Fame. And so I did a short section on, on women that like baseball. It. Of course not. Mm -hmm. Never heard of her. The history's been swept under the rug and forgotten, but it's all there in my book with dates, pictures of all of these, these women who served as owners, secretaries, treasurers, and players. Wow. I have photographs of all of them in the book. Wow. And this is the Negro Leagues book? Yes, the Negro Leagues book right there, okay. volume two. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I have three daughters, so I have to represent them somehow in a way. <laughs> Definitely. Good job, Dad. Yeah. For sure. Now, uh, here, I, I'm, this, I, I'm just so curious. There's a couple of more here. The Black Baseball in New York City. Hmm. Yes, that's just a pictorial history about all the wonderful Black teams that came through New York City, the Lincoln Giants, the Lincoln Stars, the New York Black Yankees. There was a team called the New York Black Yankees. Really? Yes. <laughs> the New York Cubans, who won the 1947 uh, Negro World Series. Mm -mm. A lot of Black teams, uh, because of on the east, Eastern Seaboard, they had a, a large population, so they had many Black teams, the Brooklyn Royal Giants and uh, the Brooklyn Eagles and many New York teams. So I had to do a pictorial history of, of those teams, and it's been one of my better sellers, best-selling books. Super, super. Now, and then the last one, I, I, I mean, you guys just have to come out here now. I, all you'll need to do would be to go to the Larry Lester, go to the Amazon, Amazon.com, uh, and then search Larry Lester, and it will take you to these books. Now, mm -hmm. uh, let's see. The Black Baseball, well, Black Baseball in Pittsburgh, what my guess would be kind of on the same level. And, yes, I did four of those. Black Baseball in Pittsburgh and Detroit. Kansas City mm -hmm. and uh, Chicago. Okay. Uh, some of them, some of them are not listed because they're out of print right now. Okay. Uh, okay. The first one, the other one that you see, Black Baseball Stats No Showcase, is out of print. So I, I did a re revised version and extended it to 1962. Okay. This going like hotcakes. Sure. Uh, but baseball stats showcases about the all-star game that was played annually in Comiskey Park. Mm -hmm. It was the biggest event in black America in the thirties and forties. Uh, it, it drew over 50,000 fans some years. Wow. To see this all-star game. It outdrew white major league baseball day in and day out. Now I, I want to just mention, you mentioned that and I want to kind of go back to integration i look and i want to I'm, I'm i know i'm going to get hit for saying this guys but <laughs> but hear me out see in during integration and what uh, brother lester what you had already mentioned and what i had already noticed is that we had a life yeah we had a life we had um I, I, all they want to show are pictures of separate but equal color right you know, colored and all that water fountains and everything but that wasn't we didn't have that in the black neighborhood it was just a nice clean water fountain you water was good too <laughs> water was good so, <laughs> so it, we only saw that when we went into the white neighborhoods right i know yeah so I, you know y'all want to holler folks want to holler integration you know really it was to me and I'm I'm just gonna say it. I just believe it was about an economics thing, you know. Well, it was. Um, <laughs> the it black was teams were out drawing. I mean, uh -huh. you go back to Chicago, Chicago American Giants, the Negro League team was out drawing the Chicago Cubs and Chicago White Sox. Mm -hmm. Fans, both black and white, wanted to see the best and rarest talent on the field, and they didn't care about the color of someone's skin. Sure and so they went to see the black teams play because the game was more up-tempo, more stylish, button run, steal and run, double steal, suicide squeeze plays. Come on, come uh, on. So they was like, wow, this, this game is more exciting, more up-tempo. 
it's it's a faster paced game. So this is where I'm gonna spend my money at today. Yes, faster paced game, up tempo, stylish, mm -hmm. and and free, free. <laughs> now some people say, hey, I, I don't want to go to the to the movie theater because they make too much noise. I want to go to the movie theater because it makes the crowd more exciting. I've gone to movie yeah. theaters where they are so excited. Folks are jumping out of their seats. It's, yeah. I mean, that's yeah. who you, you want to yeah. hang with exciting. Mm. <laughs> that, yeah, yeah. That, I, I, you can be quiet at home. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, my goodness. And here are a couple of great pictures. I just enjoyed them seeing you here uh, at the typewriter uh, yes a typewriter <laughs> yeah not a computer keyboard your age now. <laughs> yeah a typewriter number 42 getting your work in making it happen and uh definitely signing those books giving those autographs we uh don't it, just go out there guys go out to the amazon type in larry lester l-a-r-r-y-l-e-s-t-e-r -R -R -E mm -hmm. and you will see his work you will see his work and uh, just enjoy it. Okay. Okay. Now, who are the brothers behind you? That one, that one in the pirate's uniform there. Oh, my goodness. That's Roberto Clemente. Uh, is that who that is? Yeah. I've heard the name. Now I get to see him. Very handsome brother. Very yeah. handsome. That in a plane crash uh, when oh he was goodness. young. He's in the National Baseball Hall of Fame. In the middle there, that's Willie Say Hey Mays, who is still around. He lives in San Francisco. And uh, then you Willie got on Mays? the Willie yeah, Mays. Willie Mays. It's that's still a, still around. Okay. okay. And so is Hank Aaron. Okay. Hank there's Aaron there's in Hank Aaron. The uniform. That's Hank Aaron. Hammer and Hank. Okay. Uh, he's a big time businessman in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, wow! Yeah, all all of my great guys still hanging. Now, I uh, do when I, I do have to ask mm -hmm. uh, when you get a chance to talk to them. Do they even if they're busy? Are they going to drop what they wh whatever they got going to come and talk to you, brother? They always do. Uh, <laughs> I figured that. They know I'm gonna keep it real. Uh -huh. I figured that now. Now I do have to show off. This is this is Ann Moles's version. Now this is a great little book that I picked up. I just thought it was the neatest thing. It is uh, telling the history of the baseball as as what the way they see it, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the way they see it, and it's yeah, all okay. right. And uh, I just thought it was fun. But this is about as close as I get, and I'm going to have to re-educate myself with your books but th this is what i got going on my brother <laughs> good looking cover <laughs> oh, yeah th this is what i got going on i'm gonna give it a shout out that's a great good looking cover uh, thank you thank you thank <laughs> i don't you. know what's on the inside <laughs> well, well they do have a couple of pictures mine okay. aren't as fabulous as yours there's the hank, hank, aaron. The hank aaron figure Mm -hmm. yeah. I get A for that. I don't think it has that tall drink of water, that Clemente guy, but uh, <laughs> here we go. Oh, oh my goodness. And, and here's the other one. I got this one. Yes, yeah, Willie. Willie, Willie Mays. Mays. Say yeah. hey. <laughs> yeah, I got that one. So those are the two that I'm going to know about. I'm going to know okay. about them. A little You're bit. You're just scratching the surface, dear. I, just, I know it. <laughs> you said 6,000? Yeah. 6, and you know, just the that just blows my mind, and that it's a whole culture of uh, and decades of people that participated in this thing. Oh, oh yeah, and, and of course, Major League Baseball is only recognizing about thirty four hundred, but I take what I can get right now. All right, all right, and you know, we're excited for you on that, um, on that where they are finally recognizing mm -hmm. the Negro League players. We commend you for your work and, and your perseverance mm -hmm. through all of the journey. Uh, we need historians. We need you, Brother Lester. And that's why well, you were you. featured on today's Obstruction to Justice. We appreciate that you have uh, joined us today and that you are 
uh, still on on that on that battlefield. And yes, I'm a fighter, and I welcome any uh, obstacles. I turn those into opportunities. So still holding it down. And uh, hopefully there's going to be good news, which we know there is. I don't care how much time it takes. We would love to have you back, if you oh, will. Of course. I come back and, and hang with us a little bit. Because, we, like you said, we only we, I don't even think we scratched it a little surface. No. <laughs> I didn't know you went and ate at Lou's, though. Huh? <laughs> that right there, that, that's worth the interview. Shoot, I had to get my grub on, you know that. <laughs> that girl, she could burn. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> yeah. That's another story, but you are okay. you are right. I flew. I have a picture of her. I might have to share that Please next do. time we come on. Yeah, I'll share that picture. She uh she was my heart. They you know she was in my oh, heart. Oh yeah. Yum yum. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Brother Lester. Thank you. All right. And we just want to thank you for joining another segment of Obstruction to Justice. And, you know, just take to heart what we've shared today and just know that we are all Americans. If we were born in this great country, yes, we are all Americans and we all have a history and all, all of our histories are super important. And anyone that has a story to tell, tell it. And anyone that has a story to retell, retell that story so that your young people, too, will understand and be able to be inspired by it. And uh, just take care. And we'll see you next time. All right. Thank you for having me on Obstruction to Justice. <laughs> Justice. 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 Justice now.